All right, welcome everybody to uh, an exciting webinar from the Streaming Video Alliance. Um, this webinar is about video ad optimization, and we've got a fantastic panel uh, here, you know, assembled from technology vendors and even industry representatives like IAB Tech Lab to talk about sort of how to optimize the video experience for streaming. Uh, which is obviously really important as more and more people are watching streaming video. Uh, obviously, the advertisers are looking at how to monetize that. The content owners are looking at how to monetize that. And making sure that the ad experience is good uh, is important. So a little bit about uh, the SVA. I'm Jason Tebow, the executive director. Uh, the SVA is a global trade uh, industry association uh, that is dedicated to creating best practices, standards, specifications, and other documents for streaming video to improve the viewing experience at scale. Uh, so we have lots of members from across the video ecosystem, and you can learn more about the organization at streamingvideoalliance.org. Bit of housekeeping first. Uh, this video, this webinar is being recorded. So we will uh, post that to the SVA website probably later today. Uh, an email will go out to people who weren't able to attend but registered. And then, of course, uh, you'll all get the same email, so you can share it around to colleagues uh, or other people you think might be interested. All right, to kick this off, we'll go through some introductions, and then we'll jump into questions. We will try to keep some Q&A time at the end, but I can't guarantee that. Regardless, if you do have a question at any time during the webinar, uh, please toss it into the questions panel of the GoToWebinar tools, and I'll try to get it addressed either at the end of the webinar or after the webinar is over. Okay, so let's do some introductions. We'll start off with uh, Chris Hawk from Adobe. Thank you. Uh, hey, my name is Chris Hawk. I uh, work at uh, Adobe, and I manage our uh, products and business developments for our primetime advertising products. Fantastic. Uh, Dave from Comscale. Yeah, my name is Dave Romrell. I'm an engineering fellow, uh, which essentially means a technologist at Comscope. Um, Comscope recently acquired Eris and Ruckus, and together they provide, you know, very high performance network access for cable and wireless. Uh, for the past uh, over 25 years, we've been providing ad solutions that monetize cable and broadcast TV. Uh, for the past five years, uh, focused uh, much more on server-side ad insertion. Uh, for IP video with the manifest manipulation uh, product we call MVC. Uh, and our focus is really about ad execution and how, how do we do this at scale uh, for, for large operators or providers. Oh, very cool. Sean. Uh, hi, Sean Wilkinson. Uh, I run uh, corporate development, business development for Conviva. Uh, Conviva is a real-time uh, OTT analytics platform. We actually measure um, uh, both content, ads, audience, uh, and experience uh, across OTT um, CTV uh, across 253, 260 brands uh, worldwide. Cool. And then last, but definitely not least, we have Amit. Hi, uh, I'm Amit Shetty. Uh, I am with the IB Tech Lab. Uh, the IB Tech Lab is a global industry org focused on ad tech standards. Uh, we're probably responsible for a lot of the acronym soup we hear, like VAS, VPA, and OpenRTV, and all that. Uh, and I uh, lead our video and audio initiatives at the Tech Lab. Awesome, excellent. Yeah, again, you guys are you know, really representing a good cross-section of, uh, you know, of the technology involved in advertising, delivery, and insertion, and streaming video. So let's let's actually talk about that first. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on Chris uh, to start this off, but uh, what does a typical ad tech stack look like for streaming video? Is it vastly different from, you know, traditional broadcast? And, you know, what what are the pieces? Yeah, it is pretty different from traditional linear TV. Uh, obviously, the biggest difference is traditional linear TV uses more of a uh, schedule-based uh, system where ads are inserted into programs, the programs represent or, or are a proxy for an audience the advertiser is trying to, to reach. Uh, so they pick a program and day parts uh, to, 
to put the ad into and then everyone watches the same ad. Obviously with streaming, we have the opportunity to have a unique, personalized or addressable ads. Uh, and that's usually using a dynamic ad insertion system, uh, which is one of the key components of the streaming video stack, but not the only components. Um, the, the streaming video stack and advertising stack really kind of starts with the video playback or the player, which may be on a, a browser mobile device or connected TV. That player connects over to a, in the case of a server-side ad insertion, uh, a dynamic ad insertion technology. The dynamic ad insertion technology then connects up to one or more ad servers uh, uh, on the cell side, and, and then the uh, ad server may also, uh, or the DAI system may also connect into what's called an SSP or supply side platform. So this represents typically the seller's view. Uh, by seller, I mean seller of the ad inventory or the spots that would be a, a publisher or programming network. And then there's a parallel stack over on the buy side. So the advertiser and or the agency that, that is executing the, the ad will also have a ad server um, they will have a uh, and or a planning and sales tool uh, and they may also be using a, a DSP or, or demand side platform uh, if, if they're doing pro programmatic ad insertion. So that's kind of the lay of the land. As you can see, there's a lot of different components and a lot of different vendors uh, involved as well. Uh, and I could add, if you're, if you're trying to transition between them, there are solutions that uh, are available that can kind of provide from that schedule-based solution into um, a delivery that kind of gives parity. Um, and we also provide kind of a, a, a means of transitioning to opening up your old market into these new ad, ad solutions. So there's a lot of flexibility, I think, in how these um, systems are used uh, to, to help execute the, the, the ad delivery that you're interested in. Yeah, this is this is Sean from Conviva. I think um, one of the I guess pieces of insights that I'd I'd like to to provide in this particular question is um, that it's 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 certainly harder than than broadcast. But um, when we see it, you know, we look at 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 content and we look at ads. And and what I guess I would say is, as difficult and as challenging as it is to deliver content online, um, delivering video ads is as difficult. Uh, if not more difficult. And and it was really an eye-opener for us when we transitioned from looking at content into ads in that uh, the breakpoints multiply. Um, and, and I think Chris Chris actually indicated a lot of the different core components, and he's absolutely right, but it, it, it gets dimensional really quickly. So, for example, um, you're trying to manage different clients, different versions of clients um, on different players, right? And that can be anywhere from five to 15 to 20 different platforms you're trying to support. Um, in addition to that, um, when, when you're uh, in, the, in an environment where you're looking across multiple ad servers to actually deliver ads, um, you know, this can be anywhere from five to 20 different ad servers at any given time based on your strategy um, that you have to, to, to monitor and maintain. Each one of those have a CDN um, that they're relying on, which is, is, is you know, potentially got certain issues. And so there's this, this way I think about it is the core components that I think Chris hit on very, very well. And then there's that next level of complexity around um, actually delivering it and delivering it effectively that makes it actually pretty difficult to do effectively. Yeah, and the only, only thing I'd add, uh, and, and the rest of, uh, rest of the panel was covered pretty much everything that is to be uh, said about the stack. The only thing I'd add is uh, we also have to think about the uh, measurement vendors in this mix as well. Uh, buyers like to have uh, uh, an indication that their, the ad was successfully delivered, whether it was viewable or not, things of that. So that's the other, uh, other part that uh, usually comes into play. So, so, I mean, literally, it sounds like this is a crazy mess <laughs> that can go wrong at any time. Um, which actually leads into sort of my second question. Uh, and, uh, you know, Dave, if you can, you know, address this first, but, you know, I feel that like from a, a viewer perspective, when ads fail to deliver, right, we don't have this problem on broadcast TV. I don't think I've ever been watching a show through cable where the ad fails to display. Um, you know, that, that's obviously very disruptive to the viewing experience. So, 
you know, what can video distributors do to sort of prevent that? And if they can't prevent it, like completely, what can they do to help mitigate it? Yeah, I think, first of all, we need to break this into a few use cases. So the the case you're describing on cable where we deliver, I mean, and we do this all day long, all the time, uh, the uh, the ads, you have breaks that have a very specific time range, and you generally have ads or spots that are already pre-positioned, ready to go in there. And so the execution is being done by that schedule, as, as Chris mentioned previously. Um, when you go to uh, over the top or some type of IP streaming solution and you're doing live, you still have that same need to basically replace that period or, or, or fill that period of ads. And so there's a very clear real-time response needed for that. Um, and there's a whole bunch of mechanisms, at least in the both, both in the campaign side as well as in the execution side, that can help avoid the case where an ad is not actually there to, to play. Um, so, uh, so let me pause there for a second. On the VOD side, um, you don't have this um, this timing requirement in exactly the same way, and that you you can uh, essentially skip ads and and shrink the, the the duration of an asset, or you 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 don't actually get this uh, uh, black time period that has to be filled. Uh, and so in that case, you generally don't see it if there is a problem with executing an ad. It's not really affecting the user experience, although it may affect your uh, uh, revenue generating capability. Uh, the user doesn't get experience. So let me go back to the live one. In the live case, typically what I see is that if, if there's a difficulty in getting a, a campaign filled um, or there's a difficulty in getting uh, decisions made uh, for, for that, to fill that spot. Generally, in a live case, you fall back and provide the, uh, the content that's in the network feed or that came from the provider and those pass through and you're essentially replacing that. And that's actually the same in, in, in a traditional cable or broadcast delivery. Um, if you have a problem with a given ad spot, then there's also the opportunity and VAST uh, uh, provides this for fallback ads where you can actually have things pre-positioned or, or secondary ads that can, that can fill that space. And so if, if, if we have the right fallback mechanisms, we can generally make it so the user is unaware of any difficulties in, in that space. Lastly, if you actually have an issue where you're not going to fill something in that campaign, but you don't have something to put in there, generally it's good uh, uh, advice to have a slate or something that you can use in that space that at least gives the user an indication that this that the stream is still live. <laughs> so let, let me let me just put all that as as there's a lot of options for how to resolve these, these conditions. So anybody want to add to that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'd say there are probably uh, at least uh, from from uh, what I've been hearing in the uh, video working group, and this is actually one of the key things that we have been focused on when we were working on VAS4, uh, there, there are probably uh, a few main uh, uh, drivers of errors, right? Uh, so first is uh, low or bad quality uh, creatives. So you basically, uh, let's say that you have a, you're watching on a 70 inch uh, TV or 60 inch TV or what have you, and then you have something that's not really meant for that, uh, uh, that size, and so you have really, really bad uh, uh, blocking and uh, uh, all kinds of bad uh, uh, quality creators, which is a really bad experience, right? So that's, I think, one of the big, big issues that uh, 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 that we would watch for. Uh, the second is around, uh, uh, and this is uh, uh, this is definitely getting a little bit into the details, but we, uh, uh, the technical details. But uh, VPAID creatives have been a, a pretty big challenge uh, for the industry. I mean, especially for uh, SSAI, for server-side ad insertion, where you really cannot do anything with when you get a VPAID uh, creative. But it also from a uh, from uh, VPAID has also been used for client-side programmatic. I'm, I'm putting air quotes around that, which uh, has been uh, uh, the cause of a lot of uh, delays and uh, in many cases not even have an ad uh, delivered for uh, for, for you. Uh, and then uh, one of the other common uh, problems is an error between a mismatch between what the device is capable of and what uh, what is delivered to it. Right. So that's one of the other uh, big uh, big causes of uh, uh, problems. Yeah, just just adding on to that, Jason. I think I think you're you're, you're exactly right in that um, you know there there's a lot of challenges that I think shining a big flashlight on will help the industry overall grow. I think it, it really reminds me of the first time we started looking at content, 
and we, we put out a bunch of metrics and, and people were astonished. And, and now what we've done is we've, we've gotten that as a, as a whole collaboratively, publishers, CDNs, the whole industry, to try to get that under, under um, control in terms of that performance. We saw the same thing with ads. And so as we turned it on, um, you know, I'll give you a, a number. I mean, we see up to 47% of ads fail to play. Um, that has dramatic impact to the publisher um, and to the brand. Um, but from a, bub a publisher perspective, it's a missed opportunity, right? That inventory is gone. Um, what we also see, though, is that it has a dramatic impact on long-term engagement with that content, meaning it's also destroyed follow-on um, inventory for the publisher. And so it's been, um, you know, something that uh, as we've kind of uh, really started to look at it, it's something that can be addressed. That's, I guess, the great news about what we're seeing is once you can monitor it, you know, it's the old saying, right? If you if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And and I think um, uh, I think uh, Amit actually is exactly right. Is those are the are the broad categories that we see: ad requests, ad decisioning, ad creative delivery, and creative playback are the major culprits of the challenges. Now we just gotta tune in or you know focus, get start managing it, and and get get working to make sure we overcome these issues and and build solutions. Um, I think, you know, Dave mentioned that, that offer things like fallback ad, back ads, but also identify in as close to real time, whether that's VOD or live, that there's a problem, where the problem is, and resolve that problem as quickly as possible. And I think, um, you know, I think that'll have a big impact in terms of, of, of ad delivery overall. Hey, and Chris Hawk here, one other uh, item to, to add in here. Uh, I know this is really a tech-focused forum, but uh, from a business issue, you know, it may be worth noting that uh, th there may also be, you know, quote-unquote view failures or or viewer experience disruptions in the artifact of the TV um, programmer and distributor relationships. Uh, you know, traditionally, uh, this has been, if we look at cable, uh, a cable network, for example. Um, the 16 minutes per hour of advertising out of that, 14 minutes have gone to the programmer for national ads and two, two minutes per hour of advertising time has gone down to the distributor for local ads. Well, these same sort of carriage agreements are carried over to OTT and the connected um, TV experiences and TV everywhere uh, experiences. So you have two minutes per hour that the local um, affiliates or local um, MVPD uh, or distributor has the opportunity or, or has the rights to insert on, you know, but but maybe they can't technically in, insert on that uh, or it, maybe they don't want to insert it. Maybe the inventory is just not uh, compelling enough. Local is already getting a very high CPM rate um, and the inventory and connected to linear is way, way larger still than on, on connected TV. So it may be for business reasons that uh, the MVPD can't uh, enact on their two minutes per hour. Uh, and let me pick up on that really quick. Uh, so one, one thing that we've been doing with our customers is, is um, giving them the option to take inventory that they have that would traditionally be on, the, on these carriage agreements or splits and choose to sell into that area via the, the linear addressable. And so it kind of gives them the ability to make choices on where the highest revenue is, as well as choices to fill that unfilled inventory. Uh, and so there, there, there is um, solutions to to give you the, the the business policies for how you want to to address that and not leave the user experience with an unfilled ad. Yeah, which is is great. To this is where we start getting deeper to the weeds, which is great on the. Uh, addressable TV that the distributors own, that the MVPD own, in particular the five operators in the US, they're, they're doing adjustable linear TV or adjustable VOD. But on the connected TV or the TV everywhere experience, if you're watching a watch ESPN app, for example, um, that might be uh, problematic for the operator to, to fill into ESPN's app on, on a connected TV. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's definitely, I think, you know, what you guys are, are really pointing out is this is this is definitely complicated, um, and I, I kind of wanted to make a comment about something that Amit said about this idea of you know call it video ad quality parody. So the idea of delivering a video ad that is of comparable video quality to the content that the user is watching, right? So if you know they're on an HD feed on a big TV and up pops uh, an ad 
that's SD quality, you know, that's not made for that TV and it's stretched and it's pixelated and ugly, you know, that, that's a, that's definitely, you know, an awful viewing experience. And I think for the viewer, like for myself, we look at that and go like, did, you know, did something go wrong with my internet? <laughs> you know, is my connection going bad? Um, and, you know, just a little bit on that, uh, you know, the Streaming Video Alliance has an advertising working group, and we did produce a document called uh, Improved Quality of Service for Advertisement Delivery Across OTT Best Practices, and it was meant to address that exact problem. Um, so I just, you know, what you guys are talking about is there are all sorts of vectors uh, in terms of the complications involved in delivering what we can call, I guess, a good advertising experience uh, for streaming video, right? Because you know, we, we can't just look at advertising as like, oh, it's just, you know, it's just over there. You know, we don't care about the quality of the creative. We don't care about the quality of the delivery. We don't just, you know, it's just an ad, but it does really matter. Um, and I kind of want to sort of stretch on that a little bit. You know, obviously, you know, VOD is VOD, and I think we've got that kind of figured out, but everyone seems to be moving towards live now, right? Sort of that transition of linear traditional broadcast over QAM to you know, linear broadcast over OTT um, or over IP to OTT or TV everywhere or connected devices. But this concept of transitioning live from, you know, the traditional set-top box to, you know, the internet-based delivery with all these wonderful devices, you know, and, and, and you know, maybe um, let, let's start with, uh, with, with Chris on this one. Um, you know, d does that live streaming versus, you know, on-demand streaming, does, Ad delivery and live, does it complicate it? Is it harder to do than delivering ads into on-demand stuff? And then sort of, you know, I guess, you know, hopefully the whole panel can jump in on this after, but what are the different issues uh, and the challenges in delivering, uh, you know, video ads into, into live streaming video? Yeah, it, it, it does, uh, live does represent a, set of additional challenges that, that are not there with, with VOD, uh, definitely. Uh, I think we, we were talking, some of the other panel members uh, discussed the timing issue, which is uh, is a big issue. Um, you know, with, with video on demand, uh, when the session starts and the user connects uh, or selects the program, you, you could prefetch all of the, the ads. The ad breaks are generally known in advance. Uh, so you can prefetch all the ads, have them ready to serve uh, with with live, uh, it's a little bit more unknown, so we're relying on signaling of, of the ad break to give us information uh, about uh, when to get ads and what sort of ads to, to fill in. Uh, now it gets complicated in that signaling piece. Uh, what standard are we going to use? Um, does everyone use the standard correctly and, and in the right way? So I think we're, where we see the industry moving to is leveraging the SCTE 35 standard, standard which has signal marks in the uh, programming stream that you know has been used in traditional linear TV for for quite a while to indicate an ad break. Um, and then can OTT and connected TV, uh, you know, and, and TV everywhere can can we pick up and and use that? So I, I think that's kind of where the industry is going. I think that the challenge there was this SCTE 35 marker was was really um, instituted in linear TV for the uh, MVPD or the the operator to do the local ad insertion. So it, it wasn't really uh, used for um, a, for example, cable programmer, cable network to to do dynamic ad insertion in their linear TV. So now now we're trying to to expand that, and then there's a lot of different scenarios that come up. Well, in the the spot. Um, what do I need to signal for? Do I need to signal for replacement for the national ads or replacement for the local ads or both? Or do we want to keep in uh, some of the baked ads from national or from local? Um, so there's a lot of extra complexity that still needs to be worked out. And if I could pick up on that is we also use those SCT35 uh, markers and, and, and traditionally have done so in cable for a long time. Um, the uh, that there, there is a, a, a key uh, dependency there, which is that stream is actually already in a buffer to client, and the, the stream um, and to the client is already starting to render. And so you have a very finite time to go and resolve ad decisions. 
and to determine where what is the next media that's going to be in that stream before the client gets to the point where you see that marker. Uh, and so we ha we have this very rich ecosystem with VAST, with wrapper redirects and, and, and being able to go out to third party ADSs and doing resolution there. But there is a tighter dependency on the on the timing there and the scale of that to be able to get it done in a timely fashion so that you don't starve the buffers downstream and cause the client to adapt its bit rate uh, because because it doesn't ha it's not receiving it fast enough. Um, the other thing I'd pick up on is something that Amit and Chris both uh, mentioned a little bit, and Sean, I guess all of them. Um, the, this idea of a live stream now going to the big screen TV in people's homes, you know, whether that's Roku, Apple TV, or any of the, and any of those those types of devices that are attached to it, the experience the user expects is that high quality experience, and so you know. Within our, our ad execution, essentially there's criteria that says, is this sufficient for this particular uh, solution to insert? Um, if not, then, then maybe that ad is not, is not appropriate to deliver. Um, and the other thing we've worked at that I think relates to this is that um, several of our customers want to ensure that as the ad uh, creatives are coming in, that they're built at either in a mezzanine or as enough uh, superset of the profiles, and then what we look at at the ad execution is what is the content being played and how do we actually normalize that to the content being played. For example, the ad creative can have both SD and HD profiles in it, and then as we insert it, we look at the content and says, well, they're playing an HD or an SD stream, therefore we, we, keep, we clip it so it, it maintains that, that, that behavior through it. Otherwise, we've had clients that go switch up to HD and then switch back down, and that itself also causes problems. So it, it's it, there's there's a lot of of uh, I would say uh, expertise around how you execute in a live environment that has much tighter constraints and much higher expectations uh, uh, on the system. Yeah, I, I'd add to that. Uh, I totally agree with with, with what uh, what both y'all said. Uh, I think that one of the biggest challenges in live is the question of scale, right? So, I mean, and, and just to uh, articulate that a little more, uh, uh, the, the the point really is that uh, we're in the, especially on the digital side, right? We're used to being able to uh, insert ads on a very targeted uh, uh, individual basis. And in the live environment, basically what we're talking about is having a few million uh, uh, you know, people watching uh, the, the live stream and then uh, trying to uh, find individual ads for each of those is a tough challenge, right? So that, I think the, uh, Various folks are doing various things uh, to address that. One of um, one of the things which I have uh, heard of, which, which I thought was uh, was is worth talking about here, is the uh, is 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 the uh, concept of caching your ads up earlier, right? So basically uh, making sure that you have the uh, you know the mezzanine file ready and transcoded and everything uh, before you ever could get to the point of actually playing that ad. Uh, the second is uh, just caching the actual ad request itself. Uh, one of the things we have added in VAS4 is the concept of an expires field, so that uh, you, you can actually uh, uh, look at only those ads that have a longer expires field and make sure that it doesn't really expire by the time you actually deliver the ad. So that's uh, the, those are the kind of things that uh, people have to uh, you know, consider. And, and if I could just pick up on that really quick. Uh, so that sometimes people have had this question about can you make it scale? Um, I would say that first of all, you need flexibility. So we do allow zone-based decisions with caching uh, of, of the, the advert that's, that can be used for a collection of users, whether that's because they share the stream or they're, or they're within the same region and have individual streams. The other thing is that I wanna at least take away some of that doubt. You know, we, we can you know, get a million active streams all doing ad insertions off a few blade servers. Um, so it's it's, uh, it, it, Service-side ad insertion can scale with linear addressable, and we do it all day long. Yeah, and, and this is this is Sean. Just to, to I agree with, with everything everybody said. I mean, I think you know at a, at a high level, latency, fill rate, and high concurrency are problems. I, I think the other other dimension is is you know when you look at client side and, and server side, I think mo it's generally um, the case that most people are really looking at server side. Um, for live, I, we see that a ton. And I think my only point around um, server side and live, and, and it's still, again, it's, it's, it's plan, right? It's take time, plan, make sure you've done it correctly, make sure you have timing correctly. 
um, measure it, um, uh, you know, um, you know, make sure it's it's uh, uh, updated to make sure it reflects the, the measurements that you're looking for. Continue to plan and continue to plan. We see a lot of live events uh, when people get ahead of it, and it's you know they're saying, okay, listen, it's, we're going to take a, a month and a half to make sure that our architecture is de developed correctly. Um, it goes off well. When it's not, um, when when you don't take that time, uh, it can it can lead to big challenges quickly, and they snowball in a live environment that 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 uh, that can be catastrophic. Okay, um, so really quickly, just to our audience, remember if you've got a question that you want our panelists to try to answer, uh, whether it's during the webinar or after, uh, make sure you drop that into the question panel. Uh, so one of the things I wanted to sort of um, continue on in terms of discussion is around the location of ad insertion. Um, I, I'm here at VMUX, so I'm in San Francisco this week, and I've seen a bunch of presentations on you know different ways to tackle ad insertion, whether you know it's at the client or it's at the server or it's not dynamic or it's static. It's just there's so many different ways, it seems, sometimes to address the issue of getting ads into a video stream. Um, you know, maybe we can uh, we can start with Dave on this one, but you know, just thinking about that, um, what is the impact of that choice, like where the ad gets inserted, on the viewing experience um, and and sort of follow on to that in the case of deciding to do it server side whether it's in the cloud or not you know should that happen you know at i guess realistically at the edge so as close to the user as possible just wondering if you can kind of start us off with uh, with addressing those two things sure and i'll say that we've seen it all um the <laughs> server side ad insertion from a from a manifest perspective is not a lot of data. You can just think about it as a text file that's being modified uh, slightly as you go through ad breaks. And so it's not, it's not typically such a bandwidth issue as much as a latency issue. Um, we see it hosted in cloud environments. Uh, we've seen it in centralized data center. Literally right now we have one of our uh, big operators. The, the hosting of that you know, may go to their central data centers on the east and west coast. Um, we also see it sometimes put at the pop or out at the CDN edge where you can almost think about manifest manipulation as a special function uh, or server-side ad insertion as, as a special function that's for a particular content on the CDN. So in that way, we kind of see ourselves as extending the CDN. Um, so all of those are possible. Uh, from a latency perspective, often the IP streaming clients are have sufficient buffering that, that that's not really seen very much except for at the start or when you're trying to resolve an issue after after a stall uh, and so there's you know generally you know several seconds of latency before you give the manifest and the client sees it and generally they're small so it doesn't have to be at the edge um, although I do think from a scale perspective and managing audiences often customers are using BGP and taking them to a closest spot and there's Val value to some somewhat managing a large scale solution by having things regionally out at the edges, and so I would say it's it's somewhat up to the customer. Um, we see it as a mix, and in fact, we have ones where it goes to the edge and overflows to the cent to, um, into a central site. Okay, that was a lot. Yeah. Of <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Chris Hawk chiming in too. I, I'd say we also have um, clients that use both client side and server side ad, ad insertion. Um, so yeah, it, it depend, depends on you know a lot of factors as as Dave indicated. Um, and, you know, and not I, I'd say the other thing we see is the the trend is in particular with the trend of going to to live linear. Um, it, it is the, the trend that we're seeing is going to server side ad insertion. You know, but there are still legacy deployments out there that are all client based. I, th I think, you know, we, we primarily started moving into, you know, ad insertion for web video or online video with, with client side ad insertion. Uh, so there are still um, legacy deployments and platforms out there that, that are client side and newer ones for the same client that are server side. One other thing on that server side client side. One reason I see, I think we see this trend towards the server side is that, you know, you know, they, our customers often are dealing with, you know, a dozen different clients, right? They, they want to, they want to hit, 
the Apple devices, they want to hit the Android devices, they want to hit the smart TVs, they want to hit the dongles that are connected TVs. Um, we have set-top boxes with IP streaming capabilities. Um, and by going to server-side, you essentially get kind of a unified solution and a unified view into that system. Uh, and the um, sometimes there's client-side work that augments it, uh, but it'll, it keeps them from having to build specialty around all those different devices. Um, and 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 so so I so I think there's a, a value on on to the, to an operator that says I'm doing this in a spot where I can see it and manage it. Where when you put it out on the edges and distribute it and put in all the clients, they feel like it's it's harder for them to to have a handle on it. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll agree with that. Oh, sorry, go ahead. So go on a minute. Oh, uh, I was going to say I, I completely agree with that. I think that we're we're uh, in the, on the mobile front. We're used to having just two platforms, right, Android and iOS, for the most part. Uh, that's not the case on the CTV uh, OTT side of things, and so uh, uh, definitely a, a, a challenge to support that plethora of devices, if you will. Uh, the other thing is uh, also for uh, one of the other drivers for server-side ad insertion is the uh, ad blocking capability, right? So now, obviously, that should not be the way people get around ad blocking or, or the only way people get around that, but uh, and I do think it's important to provide a better user experience overall and a better ad experience overall, but that's the other reason why people are looking at uh, server-side ad insertion more seriously. Yeah, all, all good reasons. And then probably another one is, you know, as Dave said, we start expanding to playback on different devices. You know, those those devices are owned by third parties, connected TV manufacturers, and so forth. And and you know, the um, the programming network uh, may not be able to install client side code on those platforms. Uh, so they're moving some of the logic up into the server side. So, so one of the things that um, that's apparent to me, and, and listening to you guys address that answer specifically, is that there are a lot of um, a lot of points along the ad delivery chain where it would be great if you know there was some insight into what's happening. Uh, and 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 this next question is for Sean specifically uh, to, to start us out on. But you know, how how can we measure? Like how can a video distributor um, or an OTT platform or an MTPD measure what's happening with ad delivery? It's, you know, obviously it's more than just ad views. Like ad views are great and you know, we wanna know how many people are looking at the ad, but what about all of the steps along the way as they impact the sort of viewer experience with relation to the ad? So, you know, Sean, can you talk to that a little bit about like what you know what can you measure what should you measure how can you measure yeah absolutely and I, and I do want to as I'm as I'm listening to us all I, I do want to make a, a comment that and and, and go uh, go uh, just kind of add on what you were saying in terms of this is complicated but it's also very powerful right and so I, I do want us to keep that um, that focus is that it's it's changing the way in which ads can be delivered on OTT devices and delivery and it's something that um, when you talk to brands they're incredibly excited about it so it's with anything that's that's hard uh, and good, um, it typically is hard. Uh, in terms of measurement, I'll tell you where we measure. So um, we're focused, as, as, as I think people know, we focused on content first. Um, we then started looking at ads. And so we focus a, across three core areas of, of, of ad performance. First is ad delivery. So we're looking at ad start failures, the amount of time it takes for an ad to start, um, and then an exit when when the person just says, I'm out of here, um, I'm, I'm not going to watch the ad. We then move to ad experience, uh, and we look at concurrent plays of that ad, um, the rebuffing ratio of that ad, the average bit rate of that ad, and the frequency um, uh, by device of that specific ad. Um, and then we look at the, at the end, at ad completion, right? So um, what percentages are completed? Um, how many are ended plays, the percent complete, uh, actual duration of the ad, and, and, and uh, percentage of ad playback failure. Now, those are the high-level metrics that we look at, but Chris, to, to answer your, your, your question, um, what we then go is one big, huge level um, uh, lower, and what we're doing is we're pulling in all sorts of metadata um, from not only the player, but also from information that we're getting from the ad servers, 
and how they're delivering that information um, so we can pull in things like the ad ID, what CDN that ad's on, what ad server is playing that ad, so that we can get really, really targeted and focused in terms of triage around understanding exactly what's breaking, uh, how the, the, the impact of that, that or the magnitude of, of, of how much that's breaking, even to the point where we literally have customers who, who will sit there and watch our, our, our system, and when they see a failure, they'll just go in and delete the line item. Um, and, and start over and have it reconverge on a, on a, on a, um, on another ad. And so from our perspective, that's absolutely where you have to go. And, and quite frankly, it's, it's even because of the, the vast amount of data, of data that you have, you have to actually rely on a machine to, to help you. And so, uh, one of the things that we've done with content, we've actually transitioned that into, um, you know, what we're doing with ads. And so what we have the ability to do is anomaly detection. So really pick out what's an anomaly versus what could be just spurious and noise um, and immediately identify the ad ops team to say, hey, this is where we're seeing the failure, exactly where we're seeing it. Is it ad delivery, ad experience, ad completion, what metric and where? So, so that that ad ops team can immediately take impact to try to avoid this lost revenue, lost excuse me, inventory problem, lost inventory up front because of ad failure and then in the back because that failure is going to impact long-term engagement. Anybody have anything to add to that about, about measuring? I mean, that's pretty comprehensive, I will, I will admit. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's very comprehensive, and, I, and I, I, I would just say that if you're going to build a large-scale solution, you have to have the monitoring that was just described. Um, I. Uh, I can give lots of case studies of situations. Uh, once one, one situation we had, all of a sudden the clients were all adapting down and they were trying to figure out what it was. And without the monitoring, everyone's kind of pointing fingers at each other. In that case, it ended up being the CDN the ads were hosted from was not scaling. And so as they would go into the ads, all of a sudden it was, the request rate was too high or get slow and the segments weren't, 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 weren't flowing. Um, and and you, you just have to be able to to really get a, a holistic view and a monitoring of the system that helps tie all the pieces together, and, and helps and helps you isolate. You know where where can you go to in, improve the quality of the user experience? The only thing I'll add uh, is from an ad measurement uh, point of view, which is you know for the uh, the measurement intended to get to the buy side around viewability and all that. Uh, that's uh, that's something that uh, has been changing over the last few years as well, uh, mainly driven by uh, the need to support multiple platforms, desktop, mobile, OTT devices, and all that. Um, and uh, uh, the the challenge is that uh, the challenge is in being able to provide a consistent mechanism across all these uh, uh, platforms. And VPAID is something that used to be used a lot to do that, but that's been uh, uh, not not very really easy to implement on uh, the desktop because it's a black box that publishers don't like, and it's also not something that's easily supported on mobile devices, and definitely not on uh, OTT platforms. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we've been doing, uh, uh, partnering with the various verification vendors and the publishers, is an initiative called the Open Measurement uh, uh, SDK, uh, which is an API as well as an SDK that is built by the uh, uh, by the Open Measurement uh, uh, Group. Uh, that is essentially a shared SDK that all publishers can use uh, across uh, uh, and, and, and is trusted by the measurement vendors. So that's one of the things that we're doing uh, to help with that. Uh, the other thing is uh, uh, on the OTT front is still uh, something that uh, some, <laughs> I think that that's a, a, a greenfield space, if you will, from a measurement point of view. Uh, but we are working on uh, various things around that as well, uh, including uh, in VAS4, uh, we added some uh, uh, information about okay, how do you handle server-side ad insertion? How do you, how 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 do you indicate? Uh, uh, the uh, uh, while the uh, MRC, for example, would would like to have uh, your um, measurement initiated from a client, uh, it's not possible all the time. And so what we've added in VAS4 is a, a set of beacons that will indicate, okay, uh, in, uh, where is the beaconing coming from? Um, and, and that helps a lot with transparency of your, about your inventory as well. Yeah, and, and I would add at, at Adobe, we look at measurements, I would say, very broadly across three different vectors. There's the vector that's uh, 
is really around the telemetry around the the ad insertion and the quality of service around the ad uh, insertion and the ad delivery piece uh, kind, kind of as uh, Sean and, and Dave were, were describing uh, that's primarily done out of our prime time group uh, the second vector that we look at is really around the impression delivery um, and the verification that ad has been played and who who is it reached and you know kind of uh, as Amit was uh, describing you know uh, challenges and opportunities there right are we, are we doing a quartile impression are we doing a weighted duration viewing impression how do we combine linear TV you know second by second viewing with with um, digital so that, that's kind of the second vector and the second set of opportunities that we're focused on and then the third vector we're looking at ultimately the one that you know you may argue is maybe the most important in driving the industry is how do we get uh, the information back to advertisers so advertisers can justify the return on ad spend justify their investments uh, can do multi-touch attribution and ultimately feed that data into their, their uh, MMM and let me add one more thing uh, for, first of all I, I fully support everything I was just hearing um, I think one other thing, server-side ad insertion, especially through a manifest manipulation, is it's not just about the ad quality. You're now in a point where you're kind of in the center of the system and you can monitor the user experience in general. Uh, so even, even if they're not inserting ads, there's opportunities to, to uh, get insights into um, how uh, for HLS in particular, how much are they switching between profiles, uh, we, we have kind of a session detailed records that basically indicates that, you know, what's going on in each session, even the duration of the session. If, if, if the user is having a poor experience, you can actually see that as a result of them constantly restarting and, and, and shifting uh, the, their sessions and moving around. And so some of those insights, I think, are also useful. Yeah, this is, this is Sean. I couldn't agree with more. And I think that goes to the point of, of really understanding what the impact is, right? Really understanding... Um, you know, not being myopic, right? Because we're looking at overall inventory um, and, and uh, you know, being able to look at what that impact is, both on how, it play, how, the, how the playback impacts the, the overall content consumption, but also what the match is between content and specific ads. So couldn't agree with that more. Oh, very cool. Very cool. So, um, so we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, I do have an audience question that I want to get to. And then I have one other question that I want to ask um, all of you. I was going to um, ask Amit to sort of talk a little bit about BAST, uh, BAST 4. Um, but unfortunately, I think that's probably going to take a little bit of time. So I just want to say two things about that. One, uh, the, S, the Streaming Video Alliance, uh, we wrote a blog post. Our advertising working group put out a blog post. Um, basically in support of the idea that the streaming industry needs a an ad sort of standard um, that everyone should be, you know, sort of moving towards so that we can all be speaking the same language. Uh, and, and we basically said that, you know, maybe that, that BAST is really sort of the start of that. That's the foundation upon which, uh, which something like that should be built. So, you know, just you, to take a look at our website. You can find the blog post there. And, and even more importantly, take a look at um, at the vast spec, um, you know, it's it's really powerful what what IAB Tech Lab has has produced and put out uh, in terms of that. So, um, sorry, I meant we can't we can't I can't have you <laughs> we can't have you this we, yeah, we ran out of time. I'll get um, I'll get thank you. But it but it is it is really fantastic, and again, we really uh, support and promote that as um, as the potential foundation for a standardization across ad delivery and, and streaming video. Um, so the audience question, let me get to that first, and then I'll get to my last question for you guys. Uh, basically, someone had asked if, uh, if you all could describe uh, technically how server-side ad insertion manages to get into each profile in an ABR stream. So I guess, you know, um, maybe, maybe Chris, can you start with that? And then maybe Dave and, and everybody can chime in. Yeah, so, sorry, can you uh, repeat the question? Yeah, yeah, basically they asked technically how server-side ad insertion uh, manages to get into each profile in an ABR stream. Yeah, I think we're on the, the manifest, we're filling the 
uh, all the information that the the client needs for the the profiles and and there's an interplay between the the clients and and the server side ad insertion um, to help make sure the the right information is delivered down to the the client. But say kind of at, at a high level, that's uh, kind of where I'll leave it, and then I'll have to bring in uh, some more engineers uh, to go deeper on on that. <laughs> I, I could go 15 minutes, half hour on that if you want. <laughs> um, but just to make sure the person in the audience, uh, if you, if you want to reach out, we can we we can make sure we get you detailed specifications. Uh, I'm sure both Chris and I could do that. Um, the main thing is is that what what the client is doing is really act, interacting with the server side ad insertion, almost like a proxy or a server. <laughs> And we essentially are providing the the not just the master playlist, but the media playlist. And in that media playlist, we're seeing the segments, and most of the time they are marked by discontinuity or markers for the for the breaks that uh, causes us to replace the segments with the ad segments that that, that we discover from the that whole ad campaign system was there. So essentially, we're 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 looking at those text files, replacing those media segments with the ad segments on each particular uh, profile as it's going through. Gotcha. Okay, well, what I can do is I can I can put him in touch with uh, with both of you guys, and if he's got additional questions, um, he can just address them uh, directly to you. So this last question that I want to ask, just to leave the audience with something, um, you know, I, I have my own opinions on this, but um, we'll start with Chris and we'll move down uh, down the line. But the question basically is, is what one piece of advice would you give to video distributors about ad insertion in streaming video, whether it's live or VOD, doesn't matter. Just what's a sort of one piece of advice you would give somebody? Chris? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's, a, it's a good question. You know, ultimately, there's a lot of things that as was described by you know various people in this call that you know from technically man there's a, a lot of complexity here and a lot of things that that you got to nail I, you know i think ultimately that's the blocking and tackling and we we just have to do it to make sure that that we're delivering good quality experiences delivering the advertisers ad over uh and you know telling the advertiser that we did deliver that and to which audience um Again, blocking and tackling stuff. I think ultimately what we have to start thinking of is how do we improve the viewer experience? Um, insertion, advertising in general, is, there's a huge trade-off, right? There, there's this trade-off of, yeah, viewers want their content subsidized and instead of paying very, very large monthly fees, uh, they'll get quote unquote free content that's subs subsidized through advertising. You know, but they don't want too many ads, right? They don't want ads that are not relevant. So at the end of the day, you know, today we've been largely taking the linear models and and maybe moving them into to uh, connected TV into OTT and into this new world. I think in the, in the future we got to start thinking of how do we change that now that we don't need the you know 32 ads per hour programming. You know the, the the pods with national and local and the 30 second spot how do we start changing ad advertising so it's a better experience to the end user and, and that advertisers can really um, reach um, their audiences to understand who they're reaching them and, and I think that's going to change start falling on video engineering to start implementing that um, and you know something that may require you know folks that are more kind of product management like and uh, video experience optimization, not just the quality of service on the optimization, but thinking about the uh, end user experience uh, and the ad experience. So I'll leave it there. Okay, Dave. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess my one piece of advice after you listen to us talk is that this is a complex space um, and there's a lot of things that drive your decision making, but my advice is one, there is opportunity here. There's a lot of opportunity here. And you can be successful and you can start entering into it and, and, and learn as you go and still have a good user experience as long as you're testing and, and, and validating the solution. Um, and along with that, I would say is really having good partners. Uh, uh, look, look at those who have experience in this space, those who have been doing it at scale, 
learning from them, you know, building your connections with those partnership and especially with the industry. IAB Vast has done an amazing thing in, in empowering uh, advertising. And if the closer you align with, with, with those standards, with those partners and starting to evolve, you know, your, your solution, you'll, you'll be able to tap into that opportunity and, 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 and grow with it. You don't have to like, hold off because you're concerned about something you get engaged and start moving forward and 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 and, and you'll find you'll find it that, that it works out better than you think and all this complexity just says there's value to what we do and we're, we're trying to share that value cool sean yeah this is gonna clearly come off biased because this is what conviva does but um uh, my one <laughs> um you know my one uh and and, it, and and you know you hear us saying right you can't manage what you don't measure. Um, and what I would say is that, um, and, and my prediction is, is now kind of, we've, we've really kind of taken the wraps off and are now really looking at and measuring what's going on. And it's my full expectation that exactly what happened with content is going to happen with, with ads and it's going to get um, optimized. And then we're going to get to that goal that everybody really wants to get to, which is these personalized targeted ads that are, are, are delivered flawlessly um, and, and we help really the industry take off. And so that's my, my, my one recommendation is make sure you monitor, uh, deep monitor, uh, monitor, uh, monitoring um, with all the dimensions so that you can optimize and manage the solution. Great. And then, uh, Amit, can you finish us off? Piece of advice? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, I'm actually going to build off of what uh, Dave said. Uh, even though we talked so much about the various challenges and all that, I think that everyone who here it, it feels that there are solutions for pretty much everything that we talked about. Uh, so I think that I'll, I'll just leave it as uh, we, we, everyone has to get serious about ad quality, right? Both managing your creatives as well as making sure your workflows are ensuring that the errors are reduced. Uh, and there are other solutions for uh, for pretty much, uh, actually one of the things we didn't talk about was identity, right? So make sure that you are thinking about your user identity, making making sure you're taking care of your audience and making use of how valuable they are. And last thing is, uh, 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 especially with suicide insertion, it may feel like you can only do some very basic things, but it actually is possible to do some pretty interesting things, build some interesting ad experiences. Uh, I mean, one of the cool things which I'll uh, give a plug out, plug for is, uh, uh, for is, the, is a similar effort that we're working on, which is uh, uh, basically a replacement for VPAID for interactive experiences. And our uh, and we have we have been thinking about server side insertion uh, uh, from the beginning for that as well. So there are some really cool solutions in the space. Definitely should uh, uh, would recommend looking at what, all the new things that are going on uh, and uh, you know get get uh, uh, get those implemented. Absolutely, and then I'll I'll chime on with my own piece of advice: is to treat your video ads like your video content. So get them encoded uh, at the same quality. Make sure that it's a seamless transition visually between, uh, you know, the watching the content and moving to the ad so that there's not a vast disruption um, in the quality of experience. So, again, that's covered in, in the paper uh, that our advertising working group put out. Um, and I do feel, you know, that that's super important as well. So, listen, I just want to wrap this up. I want to say thank you to our audience for hanging with us for the whole hour. It's a really a great discussion. Uh, again, I'll have this up on the website uh, later today, and then an email will go out from the system to everybody who couldn't attend, as well as everybody who attended with a link to the video so that we can uh, share that with uh, all of our colleagues and friends who, who we think would be interested. So I just want to thank our panelists, Chris, uh, Dave, Sean, and Amit. You guys were awesome. This is a fantastic discussion, and I wish everybody a wonderful rest of their day. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Thanks, all.